So uh, this is an introduction <laughs> and a very biased one towards my own kind of uh, experience in the field and I'm in dinosaur in the field. I think we started microbiome work in 2004. Uh, so uh, the humans got microbiome. I think the, the first discussion was 2005, six or so, so even afterwards. And the first grants, as I'm aware, came in 2007 or so. So it's a you know long, long uh, time. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is really to, to show you with a few examples um, uh, uh, how things have changed dramatically over the years. And if you go 20 years back, even 15 years back, the classical way, if you work with microbes uh, as a microbiologist, was uh, uh, just uh, uh, cultivation. So the problem was that 99% of the bugs couldn't be cultivated uh, under normal condition. The Petri dish actually, which still is, I think, in, in universities used um, for courses or so, invented in 1887. So you really took classical microbiology, but that has, has changed because uh, the ones who could study that do grow monoclonal here, uh, they were individuals and usually gut bugs uh, like we are social beings, they work together and he could only study once at a time. So that has changed now with a new generation, so-called omic technologies, so more holistic technologies. I think the most popular one is what I call 16S profiling. It's just a small marker gene, uh, sorry, more bit of a marker gene in an organism. And uh, what you see here is two things as a scientist uh, you have to consider, you know, first, what you gain if you do an experiment sense, whether you can afford it. And uh, that's so usually a balance. You always want to have everything, but you know, you have not the money for this. So the, the big advantage of 16S profile is it's very cheap. So it's five euro per sample and you get, and this is now guts or stool samples as an example here, get of 3000 of these OTUs out. OTUs is operational taxonomic unit. It's not a species tag, it's something between a species and a genus in a, in a, in a, in a microbial classification. So it's not really a species. And uh, uh, certain things you, you, you can get really uh, uh, cheap and quick and easy. You can infer some functionality of that bug where you find a tag from. But for example, in microbiology, you always talk about strains and type strains. It's uh, not species. So E. coli, we all have. But the microbiology doesn't care about E. coli, but the, all the terms that come after, which really classify it. So we all have E. coli, but each of us has a different version with a different mutation, etc. And some of them might be nasty, uh, others not. So E. coli can be pathogenic. Uh, usually it's healthy, so it works with us. Sometimes it lives in soil. So in the details matter, and that you can't capture at all uh, uh, with the 16S profiling. So we are a fan of metagenomics. Uh, it also comes as many different incarnations. So the current one, uh, 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 which is used, is, is mostly dominated the market by Illumina. So you get about 250 species out of a stool sample, it's 3 million uh, a gene. A gene. So it's comparing to the 3,000 here, although there's redundancy and etc. I don't know technical details. And what you get, it's, it's at the moment, it's in the order of 300 euros instead of five. So it's a quite expensive. Prices slightly go down. Uh, you get the species information uh, exactly. You get lots of functional information because implicitly you have all the genes uh, that are in those genomes. And you can look into strains and variation, etc. So you can pinpoint individual SNPs, for example, causing antibiotic resistance, etc., etc. So it's a huge power here. Therefore, in the following, I will focus on this. I should say there are other ones with advantages made the transcriptomics. Uh, it's very useful, for example, in, in, in eukaryotes, where you have uh, very few coding genes. In human, it's less than 3%. The rest is just uh, a, a DNA, which is harder to interpret without context. Uh, so here we do it if we work on the ocean. Uh, we have lots of uh, protists there, etc., etc. Metapodiomics, we have uh, in a consortium here also. It's very important because this is where the functionality comes in at the end. Uh, unfortunately, until now, what you get out of samples in your 10,000 proteins and not more, so compared to uh, 3 millions, is still on the lower end, but you, you skip all the uh, regulation within a cell. You directly end up with the protein. So it's, it's a much clearer tech in a way. Uh, then, uh, last but not least, is metabolomics. Um, uh, so you get uh, not only the, the enzymes or the, the proteins, but also the actors in a chemical world. But again, there are lots of, to each of them, lots of limitations at the moment. Depending on a the company, they promise different things. There's also price dependent matter. About 800 metabolites you, can, metabolites you can name. And then there are tons of peaks where you know and is something unique in that bug. We have no clue what chemical structures are underneath. It's useful as well, but there are all kinds of things. So again, in the following, I think I have a focus on metagenomics and structure talk in a couple of ways. First, give a little introduction in the gut and then uh, 
tell you that even basics are still to be discovered. So despite all the clinical application people are dreaming of or exercising already, there's lots of unknowns still that shouldn't be overlooked. Um, then give you an example on a diagnostics front, how this is usually the low-hanging fruits. You don't have to understand causation, whatever. If, if a signal, a biomarker works, it works. So in here we are getting there. And then some examples uh, from our own work on chemical, I don't mean chemotherapy, I mean medication by therapeutic drugs, but also microbial therapy, a couple of examples, just to give you an overview where I think we, we are at the moment. So let's start uh, with the basics in a way. And it, for me as a bioinformatician, it's with numbers. So as a kid, I was looked up in the sky. I was uh, uh, science fiction, I loved. So we have about 100 billion uh, stars in our Milky Way, and that's for me a lot. So you get dizzy if you see all the stars. But if you do look into you, into the small scale, then we have about 40 trillion microbe, microbial cells in us. It's 400 times more than we have stars in the Milky Way. And I still can't comprehend this properly. So it's more microbial cells in the gut than we have human cells. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing in numbers uh, to, to start with. And, and because it's not visible, usually our senses do not work and we don't appreciate the, the variation and, and the uh, diversity within there. So going back to 2007, when the, the first grant money sort of made it to, to the end and the first results came out, uh, and there, there was, of course, lots of hope for diagnostics, but very basic stuff was known. We still don't know exactly. By now, I think we reasonably know that we have more than 1,000 species in us, mostly bacteria. There are fungi, there are viruses, and they're still both on virus and fungi side. We have uh, probably underestimates at the moment. But even for the bacteria, the exact number is not clear because in ecology you have these rank abundance curves. So you have the abundant guys that you see all the time, and then the very rare guys which might be below your uh, detection threshold. And I have, we have a few of those, if not many of those, but we can't say much about it. So I mentioned already more bacteria than human cells, and uh, there are different estimates, but think about that the, put the biomass together, you can blame one half kilogram of your body weight to the bacteria, and it's more than our brain weight. So it's also from that perspective quite something uh, that we have uh, in us. So, and just to give you how these genes and how the, the genes, this is species, and set to how the genes work, I think in, in Metahead, so one of the earlier consortia, we started uh, with 124 Danes and Spaniards, and we got 3.3 million genes and sequenced 4 gigabase per sample. Human genome, human genome about 3.3 or so, so a bit more than human genome. Uh, uh, you can't see it, but this is uh, the 100 people here. Uh, they're shown, these are the number of genes. So the more you sample, the more you see, but it's not good in linear because you see things at uh, the same time, etc. So uh, here we thought at that time, you know, we're almost done, you know, so, so sort of saturating and then we know what we have, maybe five million genes and that's it. If we repeated the exercise 2014, things became more complicated. Uh, we have now 10 times more samples, it's on 1,200 people from three continents, also US Americans in now. Um, we sequence only a little deeper, technologies have changed slightly, etc. So what you see here, the comparable curve is like this. So what you see in red here, this is genes that are more than 50% of the population, the 1,300 people sampled, and it goes down uh, to 1% here. So what you see you indeed, the, the most important stuff that everybody carries, we do see, and we don't need to sequence for that much more. But the frightening part is this basically where only one individual carries thing or a very tiny fraction of individuals. And, and therefore you have to do more in order to see how that follows. So here it doesn't, didn't look anymore that we know what's going on from three to 10. And then uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it still takes ages. Uh, it's, not, it's not finished in a way. Uh, no, not 10 times, but six times more. And in a way it goes even nuts here. It's good really up. That means this plot and we could show this now also with diseases, uh, Africa in uh, kids, etc., different stages. That we are sure by now that each of us has individual genes, and and they are not all just anonymous something. Some of them might be involved in digestive capacity properties, etc. So if you would know all of those of your own genes, you could patent your reservoir because it's unique to you, and that you have a few unique ones, it's very clear. So uh, there might be still some misprojections in, so bioinformatics stuff, but most of it, uh, I think this holds, and we have shown it now multiple times. So it's a, uh, we don't even know, that's the answer, how many genes will be in a total population, but certainly uh, we have almost 60, that was 2018, I think we are more than 100 million by now, so it, it still goes up. And uh, uh, the second question and the basic question is how we differ, and we differ a lot. Um, that was early work actually with Mani, who might be in a room, where based on only uh, 40 or so people, we found distinct uh, clusters in human population. This was from five countries. 
This was at genus level, not even at species level. It was really early days, 2011, with old sequencing technology, etc. But um, we had a hypothesis that uh, lifestyle influences our gut microbes a lot. So we thought, you know, the, the French, the French uh, wine drinkers and the Japanese fish eaters, they would cluster because of their kind of uh, uh, habits, uh, etc. But we have still no clue what drives these clusters. So the members from the five countries on all these three clusters, we did it on larger data sets. So, but the point is there's stratification in the data. So with many more data, a few, whatever, two years ago, we put all the data that we had at that time together. So I think more than 100 times more uh, at that time. It's a kind of a white paper. So how we see the, the variation in the human population at the genus level. These are, we dubbed this enterotypes, these three things here. I can call it enterotypes. But I see it like a Swiss mountain landscape. So it's not a yes or no. They're in between status here, quite high up. And you can argue whether that is one peak or two peak, or if you chop it further, it could be four peaks or five peaks, or distinct subtypes in the population. Uh, we don't know yet. I think the, the stochasticity of the data is too high to make a, a final call. People have opinions. But fact is, we do have this kind of uh, stratification in, po in a population, and still we have no clue what is causing it. So we know what's different between the endotypes in terms of microbial composition. But what the, the cause is, uh, there are still tons of hypotheses. Um, I should say also, for God, particular for students who read the first papers and all that, there's still lots of rubbish being published. So when I was a, a student many, many years ago, my professor told me in a hot field at that time was immunology, 50% of the papers you can forget. They have uh, major flaws uh, because it's a very hot topic. Everybody tries to be fast and getting the new stuff out. I don't want to give a number here, but we have seen lots of stuff that will, will not hold, although there might be in, in shiny journals, etc., etc. Um, so one has to watch out. Uh, their reproducibility is still an issue, etc., etc. So, but the, one big thing is what we call technical variation. That means if you do in two different hospitals the same protocol, or even you have your own flavor of a protocol, the results are not really comparable. And uh, uh, so we have studied it with an international consortium, I think it was 25 different labs and about 20 different protocols on just getting the from a uh, production uh, to the bioinformatics, not even the bioinformatics, the steps done. And uh, we have seen big, big differences. So you still can identify different people, but different time points of people versus technical uh, issues. It's already a hard call. So and that requires standardization, etc. Uh, we at that time, we proposed protocols, but uh, science is evolving so fast by now they're obsolete already because new technologies, new kits and whatever uh, uh, came up, etc. But that has to be watched a lot, in particular if you want to compare your data with other data. Uh, another issue at that time, it's getting much better now, was the resolution, uh, what you get out of it. So I mentioned the endotypes at the genus level. Most people measure the 16S at the species level at best. But the real power comes in at the, at the strain level. So here uh, we started early on and uh, just uh, as a proof of principle study, what you see here, for example, is that it's a time series, so two time points of different people. And in red is your own second time point and in black, the one of somebody else. And you could clearly distinguish. It means over time you keep lots of your bugs. This is only one year apart. This is number of days. It's one year here. Uh, you see two exceptions, etc. And turned out these were labeling errors. So people just uh, mistakenly uh, labeled them wrongly, etc. And, and you could swap it and it perfectly fits and they admitted it. So uh, uh, there seemed to be a power really that you can also go to single nuclear variation level. But again, it's still not uh, uh, often applied because it needs other tools, etc., etc. Um, okay, so compared to this, is, is, is very difficult. So this is just a few of the things. There are glories, but there are also pitfalls. Uh, uh, they are still around. Then let's uh, go to some basic discoveries. Uh, because again, since 2009, tons of studies. I mean, weekly, I don't have made any statistics. But if you search for the term microbiome, many, many papers per week that come out, uh, particularly on human. So let's, let's go then uh, to discovery. And I'll just give one example, birth, family, household environment, etc what you can basically grab out uh, uh, here. Uh, and the region, of course, most people interested, where are the bugs coming from in the first place? But before going to this, just again, back to the variation among the human population. This is sort of supposed to be shown here. And these are kind of association studies. So, so you try to find, uh, and many of these give me the difference between disease and the uh, microbiome. But if you ask this question, you have to go through all these little points here, meaning 
The microbiome itself, it's not a, a unique thing. I mentioned already the endotypes as a stratification on a compositional stage. There's a clearly age-dependent stratification. So infants look very different than kids and they look very different from adults, etc. And there's all kinds of gradients in between. And that is often not taken into account, uh, these differences. And the bugs themselves uh, can be, uh, be very different. C. diff, for example, is a tough pathogen in adults, but it's a normal thing in, in, in infants. Uh, to have. So uh, there are lots of things uh, we have to go into the detail to understand. There is, uh, of course, a big impact of the host. This is us. And you can divide it here in two colors in the genetic factor, host intrinsic factors, and the lifestyle factors. There was a nice paper out uh, by some groups from Weizmann Institute saying the genetic factors might be even as less as 2%. Uh, it's not undebated either, but uh, uh, they made very good arguments, but still there remains all that lifestyle, which is diet, culture, habit, physical activity, medication, whatever, name it. And uh, this has to be considered. And then there's this, uh, what we call environmental factors, and this is your local environment, geographic, biogeography. Uh, the strains in Kazakhstan look very different from the ones we have, etc. Uh, if you go in the villages there, uh, but also the, the vertical transmission. So you get, come to this, you get your seeding from your mother, basically. Uh, that is very, uh, your local environment and their household effects. So I will zoom in into this uh, to illustrate this a little more here. Because there was early claims based on 16S uh, on transmission with the mother, but at a very low resolution. So we did check it, actually. So yeah, again, where do our bugs come from? Basic question, and uh, do we keep them uh, over lifetime, etc.? So 16S said probably all from the mother at birth. And in evolution terms, I was wondering always, you know, why the father has no impact? Yeah, because we also have experience with gut bugs and would be good to carry over to our kids. But uh, so we tested this uh, anyway. I'll come back to that part. So what you see here is a study on 400 families in five countries. Families leads uh, to at least two uh, siblings uh, that we can compare to. This is a kind of a measure of single nucleotide variation. So that's at strain level now to pinpoint really the, the variation, the variants from your mother and the kid. Uh, and this is a measure of similarity of those single nucleotides. This is a time. So neonate is up to seven days, six months, 12 months. And in blue, uh, we can make cutoffs. That's clearly the stuff really comes from your mother. So what you see, the majority indeed is transferred from the mother. So same strain before birth in mother ends up in baby, in a baby poo and set afterwards. But what you see in red, there's also a not substantial proportion from the environment. So not from the mother. And it's mostly Clostridia. So it's a select, it's kind of selected against, uh, although Clostridia make up to 30% in a mother, for example. So what you see here that over time, the red fraction actually goes up even. That means that post birth, the mother, by dealing with the baby, puts apparently strains into the baby. We checked for the father as well. Again, almost no impact uh, uh, on that side. Neither sibling here. So that means the process is a little more complicated, how we get it. And, and then long-term series are really needed to, to figure out uh, what's going on over time. So we checked also the birth modus. And interestingly, um, if you have a cesarean birth, you look like uh, almost everything is, if not everything, is red. It means all comes from the environment, uh, nothing from, from the mother that implies among other things, that the birth channel is a, probably the place where, where uh, the meeting point is. And uh, in another study, we also checked um, uh, different body sites from the mother, how they end up in the pool of the baby, etc. And uh, we could see a couple of weeks, you have still skin bugs from the mother, but it's selected again. So after a couple of months, they're all gone. So it's really gut to gut kind of transmission at birth. But again, not everything. And we interpret in a way that this is a kind of protection because if they're proven in a mother and, and mother is happy, then they transfer that part also to the baby. All right, so uh, then how does, how does it go on in life in a way? So what you see here, again, this is now four years measuring time. We are still lacking lots of long-term longitudinal data. Uh, that is at the, at the species composition, so what you can see almost with 16S. And that was set, in particular adults, you keep it, it's very stable over time. Uh, so what we see here, it's almost like this. And all the studies where the stability was claimed was within a year time window. So that kind of big blob here of dots. So you can put a curve wherever you like. And apparently people decided it's similar uh, uh, in a way. But over time, what you see is a slight decline of similarity. So that's one time point of yourself to another one. 
given the distance here in, in days. And so it's a slight decline. That means we do have little, but we have constant exchange with species from the environment. If you go at the strain level, so one layer down, this is much more, I don't say dramatic, but much more considerable, same kind of plot, meaning at the same time, uh, lots of kind of strains get replaced. So if I have an E. coli strain and uh, somebody else has an E. coli strain, apparently the immune system uh, checks for E. coli, makes sense, surface structure, but if a few things inside are different, it's very if, uh, easy to, to exchange these things. And that uh, we don't know what the consequences are because most E. coli, as I said, are uh, nice ones, but you, know, you can inherit also bad ones where, where easily uh, uh, if you get it in this process. And so we check within families because we still don't know causation, but if you have longitudinal time points, you can say where, which strain was first in one person and then swapped to the other within a family. And there was quite a bit of strain swapping, so household effects, etc. But what uh, stood out basically that the fathers, uh, they exchanged much more than, than the uh, siblings and the mother with each other. So much Im more impact from a father and here maybe that's a revenge of the, of the fathers <laughs> losing out of birth so later in life. But then there's a question why and what's behind there. And here we can only speculate. Let's move in to the low hanging fruits, the diagnostic sites. And uh, I come back. Oh, so first, uh, I have to say medical relevance. I think several uh, uh, kind of uh, areas uh, diagnostics of diseases. It's, it's uh, microbial biota based markers. Uh, they will be soon applied in, in various areas. Then uh, second is the personalized medication. Uh, I come to this a little later after gut microbe assignment. I'm pretty confident that we'll make it into the clinic rather soon. A drug response, uh, you know, how you can be aware of resistance that you carry beforehand, etc. But also what kind of dose you need for the given drug, uh, uh, what kind of drug combinations might be harmful or useful. But also you can assess even side effects. So for, I don't go into all of these things, but a couple I will mention. And then the final step is always the therapy, the microbial therapy, etc. FMT, so phycomate transplantation, I have one little example. It's still a little understood, uh, needs improvement to be widely applicable. There's probiotics, lots of stuff out there, very dodgy from a pure scientific point of view. Prebiotics, uh, combination, so symbi symbiotics, etc., etc. So people, lots of work to it. I have a little story on the, on the first one here too. But let's go to the diagnostics. Okay, and again, Lots of issues like the individual variation we have. So one uh, size doesn't fit, uh, does not fit at all. We have no clue what the healthy microbiome is yet. We know we have lots of variation. So how do you want to modulate towards something healthy if you don't know what healthy is? Uh, it's good for diagnostics because they are so extreme that you can identify them. But again, and there are lots of other things as I indicated already. Good bugs can be get bad bugs in a different person, etc. So the the bad the pathogenicity is an issue on its own, uh, heavily debated. Okay, uh, for the diagnostics again, this view on the different um, variation and any microbial biomarker needs to take all that co-variation into account here. But until recently, it really strictly didn't happen because the funding, uh, as I said, was always give me the difference between these and microbiome. They didn't care about other stuff, but there are lots of confounders in there. So if you don't consider, uh, uh, then you might get wrong conclusion. And I give you one example on medication, because of all the covariations so far, medication it has the biggest effect uh, on, the, on the microbiome. So again, by now, more than 100 uh, uh, papers have been claimed to have seen a difference between a disease on the microbiome goes back for quite some time and you know again almost every week something new comes out uh, now people start also opposing view etc so it's getting even more messy in terms of is it true or not and uh, I zoom in in one obvious case or intuitive case I should say there are all kinds of different indication areas uh, uh, neurological diseases are very in at the moment and there is a true association uh, I want to go into collective cancer to illustrate the points how you come from an observation to a kind of a practical application so we were quite early in the game, uh, 2014, we had already uh, a set of 20 microbial biomarkers um, based on a small cohort, a French cohort, or, but also we had an, a, a German validation cohort to make sure it's not only a, a signal in Paris where the signal come from. And so it could detect even early stages. We didn't manage to detect adenomas, but the early stages pretty clearly. And um, it was a slightly similar uh, at the fecal cut blood test at, at that time. The G4FOB was still the norm. Now uh, people switch to FIT. But uh, so it's slightly better, so it's versus publication. But the interesting thing is, it, uh, in a combination, 
with the existing test, uh, you could improve dramatically the, the uh, sensitivity uh, by 45%. So the old test basically missed 50% of the true patients, and uh, that could be compensated if you add basically the microbiome kind of test. And uh, that has economic value, dramatic value in, in effect, but from there, it's still a long way to go. Uh, so we got a patent, at least the idea was not too bad. And uh, you have to show in various settings that that stuff even works. So we worked on lots of cohorts in between. Uh, this is a study, I think Mani was, maybe some others in the room too, <laughs> involved. Uh, many authors, that was 2019, and many different cohorts from different countries. And despite the technical variation, which was dramatic, the studies, colon cancer versus healthy, they, they mostly clustered by country and not by disease state. So huge technical study effects. Uh, but the, the, the few bugs that stood out consistently all the time really made it. So these are so-called AUC values. So the higher, the better. Uh, this is from the paper, the figures. So we're two back-to-back -back papers with very different approaches, only slightly overlooking cohorts, but very same uh, uh, conclusion. That means if you have it in one, you can predict from the signal in one to the other quite well. That or encouraging. Also encouraging was because in colon cancer, most of the gut kind of marker species, uh, they are originally actually from the oral cavities. So, so and uh, there's of course textbook knowledge uh, that there's a separate as a barrier, because pH uh, in the stomach is 1.5, whatever they never make it. Um, so we made a healthy study first, and we studied also about 500 people here, and for for the 310 species, we checked both oral and gut almost 80% showed strain transfer from the same person. So in healthy people, this was a complete dogma in a textbook. There is frequent exchange between oral cavity bugs. So they reinstall even within you. Uh, so we can, uh, uh, for some bugs, you might even call it internal infection. If an oral gut sort of goes to the gut and is bad there, orally, he is fine. In colon cancer, the marker bugs are transfer even more. So it's a leakage effect in colon cancer. That more goes through the, the, the barrier, which is not really a barrier, but at least you can uh, get more through. These are the gugs here that are even more enriched in feces or so. That means it's your own mouse bacteria that sort of enhance or whatever might even cause colon cancer down there. So some people even say brushing teeth might help, etc. But there might be even targets against the mouse uh, microbiome if you talk about uh, prevention at some point. But again, it's not clear because it's like H. pylori. They are wiped out a new population because they do something bad. But if 50% of the population originally had it, they also do something mildly good. So, so it's always a balancing thing here. Okay, the, the, there is a problem now with all this. Um, uh, at that time, Metagenomics uh, was 500 euros. Uh, now it's 300. The FOBT is, is five euros. So despite all the knowledge, economically, uh, it wouldn't make uh, any sense. So uh, one of the big claims uh, with these association studies is specificity. So in terms of colon cancer, uh, you can say that most, if not all, of the patients they have a mild inflammation in the gut. So if, what if we have not developed a colon cancer test, but an inflammation test in a way? And there are lots of other people with inflammations or other diseases with inflammation. So it's, a, it's still not clear even if you go in the thousands, but you have to actively check other diseases. And we checked uh, quite a few actually, so we are pretty convinced it's not inflammation. But uh, there might be lots of other things that we haven't considered. Uh, so it's, it's always a certain risk that you don't really uh, be very specific with your test. And that's bad uh, uh, because if you then go under surgery, colonoscopy, whatever, and, and uh, like with the blood test, if you have hemorrhoids or whatever, uh, uh, there's also blood in the stool. So there are all kinds of things uh, that you want to avoid. And uh, give you an example, an early example along those lines. Uh, that was a statement um, from a couple of Nature papers quite some years ago. And they have a big association with type 2 diabetes. Medically very relevant if you can have early detection, if you have quantification of what's there. We had a cohort as well, but in our cohort at least, um, there was a big difference of people who took the drug metformin as a first line type 2 diabetics drugs and the, the rest. So we got, and it's a good thing in the field, not always you get data or metadata from others. We got the data, we could compare, we could disentangle the signal from type 2 diabetes and from the first line drug metformin. Again, 50% in Europe and China, uh, fewer people take it. Um, and you have these classical rock curves. I hope you know these kind of curves. Again, it's in, in diagnostics. Uh, the perfect curve is here. 
if you see all the ones you want to see and you don't see anybody you don't want to see. So you have no false positives, but you get all the guys you want to detect in a way. That's a perfect curve. And black, that was a perf reported, and we have also seen it. It's now in three cohorts. Uh, but you see in orange here, that is a curve for the drug metformin. So given the kind of curve you can say now, you can see immediately, uh, based on a poo sample, that the person has taken metformin, etc. That might be good for forensics at some point, but it's not what you wanted. What you want is a type 2 diabetes. This is a green curve here. And that is a little above average. So that's random here, the middle line. And in colon cancer, it also doesn't look great if you take everything, but in a way you are far away from any kind of uh, clinical application at that stage of research. So that was really worrisome and therefore um, comes the next point. We studied a little further how the relation to uh, basically medication is. In this case was one drug. So we had teamed up with a quite a, a bunch of microbiologists, large microbiologists. This is not petri dishes anymore. Now it's in vitro communities, or it was 30 represented gut strains, and we could test 1,200 of these drugs in, in a really in a screening fashion. So it's basically we have now uh, 1,000 new drugs versus one bug in one day. So this was really automated uh, uh, with lots of robotics in an aerobic chamber. The readout is optical density, uh, so we can see whether uh, the growth is dead or, or whether the bug is dead or diminished, etc. Okay, so long story short, complicated outcome, complex figure here. This is a result of our, our screen. So you have here the 1,200 uh, market drugs versus a 40 kind of bacteria in that setup. The drugs are divided in three groups. The green is a uh, antibiotics, a classic antibacterial drugs. You would expect that they hit. In blue, these are antifungal and vitus so or other anti-infectives. We could say they're usually quite harsh against those bugs. They want to kill them. So you might think also there is something here, but uh, to our surprise, it's a middle range. It's what we call human targeted the drugs. This is sort of the cancer drugs that are ascribed to hit your human cell, etc. Uh, so a quarter, more than a quarter, and we think it's much more than a quarter, uh, actually affect your, your gut microbiome. My metformin being only one out of many in a way. And because we assumed low doses, uh, we only tested 40 of our more than 1,000 bucks in us, our commensals. So a huge potential of impact that we haven't reconsidered. And all, many of them that we could show also cause side effects. So really, if you have diarrhea, uh, there are lots of reasons, but many point back to some bacteria screw up in your, in your gut in a way. So three points here. One is, even if you have a hit there, have in mind that antibiotics are designed against bad bugs and not against your commensals. Yet you hit your commensals. So there's lots of collateral damage they cause in a way with consequences we don't even know. Some uh, interesting thing is some of the human tired drugs, they are like this one here, it's just basically all bugs are killed. Uh, so they really behave like broad spectrum antibiotics. And we have a few cases like this, you can even rep repurpose those guys, because uh, this was not wanted uh, if you have a remote drug against uh, rheumatism. And you know, it's perfect as an antibiotic, so that could be a nice scaffold to uh, go on with that, etc. And uh, last but not least, an important thing, many of them have very specific effects. So the drug only kills one out of the 40 uh, uh, we checked. And that might be as a starting point for having very specific targeted kind of antibiotics, which is for the future very much needed. Um, so there are lots of starting point from an optimistic perspective, but from a pessimistic one, really drugs, if you take drugs, they mess around a lot with you and your gut. And again, gut feelings and, you know, there's lots of stuff, even laugh, uh, you know, emotions with a context that fits. So out of balance has many, many side effects that are subtle. Okay, final point on this is that is one drug per one bug, etc. And, and there's only one direction. So I mentioned already, we, we tested, no, I didn't mention, but we tested lots of drug-drug interactions, a combination of drugs, antibiotics, even with food ingredients, etc. We reported on this, there's lots of facts, uh, unexpected effects along those lines that the, the drugs interact with each other in terms of targeting the, the bacteria. But there's also the biotransformation, so the way around. It's not the impact of the, gut, of the drugs on the bugs, but the, the bugs on the drugs. So many drugs are taken as pro-drugs and the bacteria cleaves them off to release them, etc. That's desired effects, but in many aspects it's not desired. They're just nibbling on your drugs and you need a higher doses if they all eat away what you consume in a way. And that was a pilot study, 25 bucks on 15 drugs only. And you could see a, a really a network of uh, the bacteria interact on the drugs you take, the drugs interact with the bugs, etc. And there are lots of mechanisms. A new one, we came across uh, what we call bioaccumulation. It's in a, in a normal environment. It's a well-known thing in a garden, hasn't been described. So basically the bugs just swallow your drug, uh, keep it inside, and at some point they go out. So it means they really transform the kinetics, the pharmacokinetics of it. 
and that needs to be into account, taken into account and but you need an individual imprint because everybody has a different composition. So here is the hope. If you know what the composition is, you can sort of start speculating more cleverly how much you need per person, et cetera, et cetera, that are meant for this. So a goal is really individual microm status and then her guide medication from this. So final point is on a, on a therapy, just a small anecdotes is quite some time ago already. FMT was a big hype and there's still uh, lots of good stuff coming out of there. And uh, the showcase was always uh, C. diff in a way, uh, infections, where I think they had to stop the clinical trial because uh, the FMT was so much better than antibiotics uh, that people have to take or so, and more than 90% success rate. And that has been repeatedly now confirmed for C. diff. Friends of mine have conducted, I think, almost 100 different indication area FMTs or so, and the results were rather mixed. And for some things, I'm not an expert, but for some of these trials like Crohn's disease, etc., people still debate, is it the 30% success, is this lower, etc., uh, depending on. So it's, and others is a struggle, but, and we, but we have still no clue how it works, you know. So it works uh, because probably, uh, in C. diff at least, is so offset, uh, such a dysbiosis that it's easy to reinstall. For other diseases where it's only mild shifts and a few key bugs, etc., like colon cancer, um, I think it's very hard to have a success. But for that, we need to know what the situation uh, disease by disease. So we did a study together with Wilhelm de Foss and uh, Max Newdorf also on uh, FMT for metabolic syndrome. Lots of uh, volunteers, everybody wants to get slim uh, by having a, uh, even this nasty procedure. And I don't know in procedure issues because there are lots of different ways you can do it and again, debate on it. But what we tested on a species and on a strain factor, strain again, looking for single nucleate variation to see uh, donor acceptor strain. And this is a result very hard to see. This is the outcome on, the, on a patient. So three of them, it's only five patients. Three of them had the same donor in a way. So this is measured in a patient afterwards. And this are the different days up to three months has been measured. So in orange is donor specific. We have a certain uncertainty here uh, on this is newly detected species. We have an error bar here. Um, if you have it here, then it's common donor and recipient. So at the species level, you can't say anything. So you have an E. coli and a donor, you have an E. coli receptor, it's still there. But that, these are the recipient specific uh, species. So basically the, the orange is a new species stuff. It's hardly above the uh, detection level. If you do at the strain level, you can be much more precise, obviously. See a pattern you would like to see. And so that is basically the blue is new stuff. And uh, the orange is, sorry, the orange is, is donor stuff. And uh, what you would like to see that the donor stuff says after day two, you should have only donor stuff because they pump a lot of donor bacteria into you. And then you see a clear rejection pattern where the blue, so your own stuff takes over. In three months, you're almost the same as you were before. So no effect. So here, if you more mixed scenarios, etc., this one we don't understand. It should be uh, orange here. But who knows? Um, but th those kind of things you can go uh, into much detail now. So what the, we take home from that study was there is nothing like a super donor. There are biotechs in the U.S. who sell this stuff. They collect poo from uh, celebrities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we, we consider it more as a as an interaction between the donor and recipients, so a kind of compatibility uh, uh, you need there, and with three different outcomes. And, uh, but we see that donor strains easily can colonize. And that's again, it's mostly the strain. So you have to have an E. coli already, then another E. coli is easy to sneak in. And that's also confirmed in that kind of study. Uh, so if you have the species already, then uh, a strain transfer is very quickly. And that has uh, uh, advantages, for example, if you consider multi-drug resistance, etc. So I think uh, it's a dilution effect uh, quickly possible. And uh, uh, interesting for us was there was coexistence of, of, of the two. Uh, uh, if you have a 50% donor, 50% recipient, in ecology it shouldn't be. One should outperform the other, outcompete the other. But because we measure poo and whatever the surface of your gut is probably two tennis courts or something, we hope there or we think there are sub niches where one wins over the other and they don't exchange that frequently. Okay, so I'm in the end just to uh, sum up here. So I think these meta genome wide association studies were extremely instrumental and you need to still many more to understand stuff to start with. And they are sufficient for diagnostics if they are backed up with all the confounding factors. But you have to couple it uh, for mechanistic understanding if you're going to go to to a therapy you want to know what you're doing uh, in a more guided way and I think here what we call in vitro microbiomics in any form is needed so you need to have experimental support on this um, 
and then you can enable modulation. By modulation, I mean you not only change it, you change it towards a desired goal. Um, because so far, human beings messed up all kinds of ecosystems with a good hope uh, or good uh, good idea, but it didn't work out. So that same is true our complex uh, microbiome. So with that, I think I thank your attention. I'm five minutes, three minutes over. It's okay. <laughs>